Lecture 1, Programming for Performance. By this point, I'm certain you know what programming means, uh, but we should take a minute right off the top to define performance. This course is not about how to program when other people are watching. Fun as that can be, as the popularity of hackathons shows, what it's really about is making a program fast. Okay, well, what does it mean for a program to be fast? Uh, we'll start off just thinking for a moment uh, about a real-world example. So here is a picture uh, of Lucas. He's uh, an SE 2015 graduate uh, at Waterton Glacier International Peace Park uh, in uh, what is the Continental Divide Trail. Now, the Continental Divide Trail runs between well, Glacier National Park uh, in Montana, up at the Canadian border, all the way down to the Mexican border in New Mexico. Uh, and the Continental Divide, if you don't remember from geography class, uh, is basically the dividing line between where the water uh, you know, rivers flows out to the Pacific on the west side and out to the Atlantic, probably through the Mississippi and you know, the Gulf of Mexico uh, on the east side. Uh, and its discovery was apparently a big deal you know, for explorers Lewis and Clark as they were moving west to try to find the Pacific Ocean, that kind of thing. Not that important. The real focus is that there is a trail. Uh, and the trail is estimated at about 3,000 miles. That would be 5,000 kilometers. Sorry for the non-metric units. Uh, and it takes uh, about five months if you want to travel it. Uh, and you might ask yourself, well, how do I do it faster? Uh, and we can think of several ideas that might feed into the idea of how we could do this faster. Um, you know, there's relatively little magic if you want to travel the entire trail. I mean, if you just wanted to get from point A to point B, you would fly. You wouldn't you know, have to take five months to do it. Um, that would kind of defeat the purpose, though, uh, because you want to see the trail and you want to enjoy it, but you know, only up to a certain extent. So uh, we'll think about how do we do it faster. And one of the things that's noteworthy and this map gives us a little insight into uh, is that there are different segments. Uh, and the segments are broadly represented as being you know, journeys between any couple of uh, marking points on there. So you know, if you're traveling uh, along the trail, you might travel from um, uh, Lake City, Colorado to uh, Monarch Mountain Lodge in Colorado. Uh, and that is a particular segment. And it might get you thinking about, well, if the goal is to decrease the time of the total journey, one way we could do it is to find out if we can speed up uh, an individual segment. Uh, and that kind of thinking is on the right track. It's a way that we could do this faster. Now, normally, uh, as our first order of business, we would go over the course syllabus. Uh, we will not uh, in this particular video. There will be some separate information about that. Uh, because it is an online asynchronous term, it makes no sense to put the syllabus stuff in this video uh, because it will probably be different uh, in, in every future term. So it doesn't really work to have it here. Uh, nevertheless, if you haven't already, you should check out the syllabus for the course in the term that you are taking it, uh, because it does contain a bunch of important information, including you know, logistics type stuff uh, that will be helpful in completing the course uh, as it should be. So we'll skip over that for now. But uh, again, if you haven't, I encourage you to you know, pause this video and, uh, and go do some homework on that. The other thing to point out about the course uh, is it is open source. Uh, all of the lecture materials are open source. Uh, you can go and take a look at the notes and the slides. Uh, they're all in GitHub. Uh, and if there is uh, an error of some sort, uh, if you have an improvement to suggest, uh, then you can certainly do so, both in terms of opening an issue in the GitHub issues tracker uh, or by submitting a pull request uh, if you feel comfortable enough with LaTeX as a technology uh, to make that happen. Happen. Um, you will probably find, uh, because this is uh, being recorded after you know, a significant overhaul of the course material, uh, that there are a couple of errors that you spot in the videos that may already be resolved in the notes and slides by the time you get to them, so just keep an eye open for that. Uh, if I spot something is wrong, I you know, will try to correct it as I'm going about recording the videos, uh, and uh, may may not uh, correct it in the actual slides we're looking at, but just correct it in the repository for the future. Uh, and if that's the case, then, yep, already attended to. 
Uh, and because it was a major overhaul, there is a chance that there will be a few more typing issues and things that normally would get cleaned up already. Um, but because it's a uh, first run of doing the course uh, with a new language, it will be a little different. But any help that you submit uh, is appreciated, uh, and I thank you for any such contributions in advance. So let's get back to the question that we started on, which is define performance uh, and a you know, broad informal definition to say, okay, we'll make the program fast. Okay, but what does it mean for a program to be fast? There's a couple of different definitions that we could think about. I mean, here's the thing that's very fast. This is an SR-71B Blackbird. Uh, it is a stealth aircraft. It travels very fast. Uh, it was also highly classified for a long time, so you could set all kinds of speed records in it, but nobody knew about them because, you know, classified, you can't tell anyone. Um, so, well, I mean, that's one kind of fast. It gets from point A to point B very, very quickly. Um, but it's not the only kind. Um, although this is, you know, the two cockpit version, um, it's not exactly a cargo craft, so if you were trying to get a large amount of stuff from one place to another, this might not be the tool to do it with. Uh, if you have to get a person somewhere in very fast time, then sure, this is great. But not if you also need to take, you know, a large amount of things. Okay. Let's think of program execution as being some number of items, things to do. Um, and this really gives us two concepts that are interesting. There's items per unit time, uh, which is bandwidth. Bandwidth is the kind of thing where more is better. The more work we are accomplishing in the same amount of time, the better we're doing. You know, that's what we want. Um, the other measure that's interesting is latency. Uh, and latency is the time it takes to complete any individual item. Uh, in this case, less is better. A smaller amount is preferred. Um, now, improving on either one of those will make your program faster in some sense. Uh, which ones you will want to do and which ones you will be able to do will vary depending on the problem domain that you're working on. Uh, but we will uh, look into both of these things and we can see that there's sometimes some synergy between them uh, and that they can interact in, in a positive way uh, so that improving one also by its very nature uh, improves the other. So here's a quick example uh, of a way that these two concepts are related. Uh, and it is if we reduce the time it takes to complete a particular item from five seconds to four seconds, it means that we could go hypothetically from completing 12 items per minute to 15 items per minute. This would be good um, if the thing that we're talking about is, you know, an auto grader that marks assignments or something, you know, completing them in four seconds instead of five is preferable because you know, it allows us to mark uh, more assignments in uh, less time or the same uh, number of assignments in less time. Uh, either way, it is desirable, especially if you were a TA in this course. Of course, the conditions have to be right. It only really provides this benefit of 12 items per minute to 15 items per minute if there are actually enough assignments to do. Uh, if we're talking about we're running a web server and the web server can you know, respond to a request in you know, four seconds instead of five, that is better. The caller on the other end is, I'm sure, happier with four-second response time com uh, compared to five-second response time. But it doesn't mean you are now increased from 12 items per minute to 15 per minute because there just might not be that many calls. There might not be that many invocations of this service such that, you know, it really provides the benefit of increasing it that much. You know, that will happen. Uh, it, it really depends if your conditions are correct. Um, now, hopefully, when we improve one metric, we improve both metrics. Um, there is no guarantee that that will be the case. Uh, sometimes we have to pick one. Sometimes improving one uh, makes the other one worse, uh, which you know, isn't what you want, but it can happen. Um, hopefully, most of the situations we're looking at, this is not the case. 
So to give a more formal definition on bandwidth, bandwidth is about how much work we can accomplish simultaneously. And a lot of the time we're going to focus on bandwidth because parallelization is a very powerful tool uh, that allows us to increase the number of items we can accomplish per unit time. Uh, you know, if you look at CPUs these days, uh, they tend to be multi-core. Uh, now, if you want to buy a CPU, it's likely going to be you know, eight, 12, 16 cores, uh, which was uh, not necessarily the case uh, even a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically by using all of the hardware that's available, we can accomplish the you know, larger amount of work in the same amount of time uh, or the same amount of work in a smaller amount of time uh, by using that hardware that is available to us. Each individual item might not take uh, a different amount of time than it would doing it sequentially, but parallelization is very powerful in this regard uh, in that we can usually end up with quite a lot of improvement as a result. Uh, and uh, as Andrew Tannenbaum says, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurling down the highway in, in what I'll describe as you know, a very um, 1970s kind of analogy because, you know, station wagons and tapes uh, and uh, let, let's just say neither of those are really in vogue right now. But the idea is still valid. If you had to transfer a, a huge amount of data to somebody else, uh, if, if you were um, me and you wanted to transfer all the uh, recorded videos over to a colleague for editing, and if uh, Professor Lamb and I uh, co-teaching this course, uh, well, one person was going to record a video and the other person was going to edit, probably the most efficient way to transfer those many gigabytes of data would be to put it on a USB drive uh, and move it from one person to the other using you know, physical means, that is, you know, drive over and drop it off kind of thinking. That would work, of course, except for the fact that at the time of recording, Professor Lamb is in New Zealand uh, and I am in Canada. So driving over is a little bit impractical. So we would have to, if we were going to take this approach, actually transfer it over the Internet. But it would not be the fastest way uh, if we happen to be located in the same city. We do our best. Um, latency, on the other hand, as I mentioned, is the time it would take to complete any individual task. Uh, and it's also sometimes thought of as the response time. Uh, and response time is important for users. It doesn't necessarily get measured quite as much as uh, bandwidth because bandwidth is usually easy to measure. Um, but it is especially important for tasks where people are involved. Latency is very noticeable to people when they are using some software, when they are doing some work uh, or playing a game. Uh, if you have played some online game, especially if you want to play it at a high level, uh, you will probably notice that uh, having a high latency really makes it difficult to play the game and win. Uh, and uh, the same is, uh, is true in other problem domains, that high latency introduces various uh, difficulties that are occasionally noticeable. Uh, you may have seen such a thing if you have recently been in a Zoom or WebEx or other similar call uh, where there's enough latency that you and another person want to talk and you both end up talking at the same time and then there's a little bit of, you know, oh, sorry, you know, no after you, you know, oh, no after you, Canadian standoff. Uh, as of recording, this this happened to me in a work meeting uh, recently a few days ago uh, where uh, another person and I were uh, both trying to make points, but we had a fair amount of latency and it resulted in uh, ultimately you know, <laughs> a little bit of uh, back and forth of after you, no after you, and eventually the... Uh, the person chairing the meeting uh, stepped in and said who gets to go first latency is occasionally painful perhaps uh, more noticeable to you now uh, than ever Google does care about latency uh, in some scenarios uh, for example in domain name resolution this is you know turning www.google.com into an IP address that the computer can uh, communicate with uh, that's using DNS the domain name resolution service uh, and it, it is slow, it is noticeable every time you try to load a page, so Google actually you know, takes some effort to have very fast, low-latency DNS servers, uh, and they operate them, They're providing it this 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 DNS server. Now, 
this example we usually do in class uh, and frequently uh, you know there's at least a hundred people in the class when we do it so the, the scenario is a little different but if you wanted to make a hundred paper airplanes I would say what's the fastest way of doing this and someone will come up with a suggestion that says look there's a lot of people in the room uh, why don't we have everybody in the room create one paper airplane that's true uh, and that would broadly speaking work but when you get down to the practicalities of it you start to notice there are some things uh, about it that you might not have thought about immediately but will end up having an impact on how this is all going to go for example do I have at the front of the room the 100 pieces of paper that need to get turned into paper airplanes? Well, how do I distribute those? You know, distribution of work to the workers is actually important. If I'm very slow in doing so, it's really not helpful to have 100 people folding paper airplanes because you know, if I'm handing them out slower than I could do them myself, why don't I just do them myself? So there are inevitably going to be some difficulties in things that we... Uh, try to parallelize even though we might have a lot of resources available for parallelization so it's not always quite so simple uh, as simply to say yeah you know just hand it out to everybody the end you know all done everything will be great on the other hand um, you know if the distribution mechanism is efficient then uh, we're in good shape and this will actually be much faster than if I were to try to fold them all myself uh, and if there are more than a hundred people in the room there could be some people who are devoted to uh, handing out the various uh, various pieces of paper uh, and some people who are devoted to folding them uh, and that will you know, be even more efficient than if I hand them all out personally so we will we will see as we go through the different kinds of problems that we're looking at sometimes distribution matters uh, and that we should pay careful attention to those kinds of scenarios okay uh, for one last sort of wrap up about bandwidth versus latency uh, if you consider here uh, on an xy axis bandwidth and latency uh, we can see there are kinds of problems uh, or kinds of scenarios that fall into each quadrant where you have high bandwidth and high latency which is you know I'm walking a USB drive uh, of data over to somebody it's a large amount of data and so uh, although I walk fairly quickly I guess compared to the average person it's not very fast compared to the speed of light that's for sure uh, on the other hand we can have high bandwidth and low latency kind of scenarios where we are able to you know, with our gigabit internet connection up upload a huge amount of data very quickly uh, we can have you know, low bandwidth and low latency kind of things this is DNS server uh, you can think of something that goes in any quadrant to highlight the difference between the bandwidth and latency topics what we've gone over mostly has been like communication type stuff and that's important but not actually the focus of this course communication courses do exist and if you want to take them then you know by all means please do we're really more interested in completing the work items that is there's a computation or there is some other um, work that we need to do and really uh, that that completion of it uh, is the important part and not so much you know the communicating of results although communicating of results does matter you know in in the end uh, because if you're a user and you, you know, are looking at getting a result back you do care about when you get it uh, you know, it doesn't matter if the result was available immediately but it takes you a week to get it um, which can happen um, you will probably be familiar with that from like a final exam uh, if you have a final exam at the beginning of the exam period uh, it may be the case that the professor has it marked already uh, and it's all ready to go and everything but it's not released until grades are published in quest uh, and that can totally happen uh, in which case um, you know you it doesn't matter how fast the TAs marked it uh, you're still kind of unhappy about it because uh, it takes a long time to get the result but uh, ultimately you know that's that's not the kind of thing that we are um, talking about we're interested in completion of the items and we'll broadly assume uh, that once it's completed then you know getting that information back to you is is quick so hopefully we now have a good understanding uh, of the difference between bandwidth and latency now we'll talk for just a minute about improving latency now 
as we get into the first part of the course, um, actually we're going to focus a lot more on improving the bandwidth because parallelization is a very powerful tool uh, and we're going to spend a good amount of time actually talking about that uh, and seeing what we can do with it. Uh, for the moment though, just a little digression onto latency. So when we are improving our code, uh, we can always start out if we want by trying to improve single thread performance. Might not give us the most benefit, but it might be worth a try. Um, and there is a limit to how much you can improve single thread performance. We'll see as we uh, you know, get into the details uh, of you know, evaluating our speed up and things like that. Um, how does that all work? Um, but at least for now, take my word for it that there's a limit to how much you can improve single thread performance. And hopefully improvements that you make in single thread performance can and will improve the parallel version uh, in that it makes it you know, work better when you parallelize it. Um, that's hopefully the case, not a guarantee because sometimes the uh, parallel version uh, ends up being, you know, based on a, an algorithm that's a little bit slower in the sequential version, uh, but parallelizes better. Uh, and you can go the other way. You can take a uh, an algorithm and replace it with one that's faster sequentially, but it's harder to parallelize. Uh, and if that's the case, then you know, there is a, a certain trade-off uh, as to what you're actually going to do uh, to find out you know, what works best for your scenario. And one thing I want to point out is that you can't, at least consistently, successfully make your code faster if you don't know why it's slow. Uh, intuition frequently seems to be wrong in this scenario. Um, I can think of an example that we'll come to later in the course where I had a theory as to why a particular version of the program was slower than it should have been, and my theory was wrong. Uh, and how did I know that? Well, I ran the program using a profiling tool uh, and you, know, you run your program with a realistic workload uh, and that workload uh, should be you know, observed by the profiling tool. Uh, and then it gives you some actual data uh, and it is better to actually measure what is going on as opposed to guess. Uh, don't guess, measure is uh, one of my uh, favorite rules of engineering, so to speak. Uh, and you will get better results uh, by measuring than you would by guessing. This is not to say that guessing never works. You, know, you uh, can make improvements in your program by guessing. It's just not necessarily going to be the most efficient route uh, or the most effective, uh, and broadly speaking, uh, you know, not as reproducible uh, because guessing is, I hate to say it, but hit or miss. Okay, let's take a quick minute to visit this page, computersarefast.github.io, uh, and we're going to take a quiz on how fast computers do some certain operations. Uh, in previous terms, we would have done this in class, where I would you know, stand at the front of the room and I would ask people to you know, raise their hand to vote for a particular answer in the quiz. Uh, and then based broadly on whichever vote I thought had the you know, most uh, hands up, then I would choose that option. We would see if it was correct or not. What I encourage you to do, and I'll uh, link it in the description, uh, is to go to this site and try it out and see how you do. Uh, and we will discuss a little bit the results after you do so. So yeah, take a minute and uh, please give it a shot. So this is our quick overview of the computersarefast.github.io page that I just referenced. Let's find out how well you know computers. I'll give you a little bit of lead in. Obviously we're not going to do the exercise because then you would see the answers and that would defeat the purpose of trying it yourself, which is something that I really think you should do. Um, but in any case, all the programs have a variable number in them. Uh, they are typically C or Python programs. Um, and the goal is to guess how big number needs to get before the program takes one second to run. Uh, and you don't have to be super accurate. We're just interested in order of magnitude. So you have to be you know, not wrong by more than 10 times. So if it's 40,000 or in this example, 38,000, both 10,000 and 100,000 are considered correct because you're in the right ballpark. The goal is also not to be super precise. You know, every computer will be different, you know, disk speed and network speed and everything like that. 
Um, but broadly speaking, um, if you know what order of magnitude you're in, I mean, yes, a new computer will make it run faster, but not like change code that runs you know, five times uh, in one second into code that runs 5,000 times in one second. So we'll see. Uh, in any case, uh, there are uh, 18 questions, uh, and you know, they, they typically look like this. Uh, and uh, guess iterations in one second. So how many iterations of this loop can the program go through in one second? Uh, and you choose by clicking on the answer that you think is correct, uh, and do the same through all of them. Uh, and uh, well, when we get to the end, we'll discuss at least a, a little bit uh, what we saw. Okay, so we'll do a little bit of self-assessment. Are the results surprising to you? Did you do really well or really badly? Um, of course, chances are you got some right and you got some wrong. Uh, but the ones that were wrong were probably wrong by a lot. You know, not just a little bit wrong, you know, oh, you clicked 10,000, but 100,000 was the correct answer. More likely, they were off by several orders of magnitude. You know, you, you clicked 10 and it should have been a million, or you clicked a million and it should have been 10. So the moral of that story is you shouldn't guess at what the slow parts of your code are. Um, I haven't kept uh, good statistics about this uh, over previous terms, but suffice it to say in most terms, when we do the exercise in class, uh, as we move through the exercise, we get a few right, we get a few wrong, and, and when we're about halfway through uh, to about two thirds through, it starts to become apparent that there is a tremendous likelihood that we might get less than half of them right concerning um uh, and you can say well you know that's just wisdom of the crowd kind of stuff you know if uh, if i did it alone i would get more of them right and maybe that's true uh but you know, be honest with yourself how how did you do in that quiz anyway the lesson that i want you to take away from this is it's okay to have a theory but you got to test your theory what you in intuitively think is slow might not be slow what you intuitively think is fast might not be fast uh, and it will work out for the best if you test your theory and actually get some numbers to it okay so i want to talk broadly off the top about uh, some strategies and these are just like high level here are some ideas about ways in which you can improve the performance of your program. We're going to go into details about all of these things later on uh, and see actual examples with actual code. But for the beginning, we'll just start with some high level thoughts about here are some broad concepts. So the first one is do less work. All right, um, a surefire way to be faster in terms of you know, executing your program is to do less work. Uh, and in particular, you would om omit work that you don't need. Uh, obviously, you can't skip everything because you do need some results, you do need some work, you do need some outcomes from your program. Uh, it's not okay to just skip over all of it. That would be silly. But two practical ideas for doing less work you know, and still having a you know, meaningful outcome to your program uh, is number one, avoid calculating intermediate results that you don't really need. Uh, if you are calculating an average or something, you can wait until all the results are in uh, and then calculate the average when it's done. You don't have to calculate the average so far. I mean, as we just did, uh, if if you were like me, uh, in doing the uh, computers are fast GitHub.io quiz, uh, as you go along, you're calculating your score. Like, oh, you know, we got five out of seven right so far, and you know, what does that calculate to into percentage? You are doing a, a calculation of an intermediate result. You know, so far we've got 17% wrong, uh, or you know, we've we've got 28% wrong so far. That's an intermediate calculation, which you don't really need all that matters is at the end you know what is the total percentage we got right or wrong uh because you know on a on an exam on a, a quiz on an assignment or whatever you know the, the the final value is the one that goes into the grade calculation spreadsheet right doesn't doesn't matter too much uh in in the long run you know how intermediate steps went 
So that's something to think about. Uh, and number two is only calculate results to the accuracy that you actually need in the final output. Uh, and this is something that we're going to come back to uh, a little bit later on. Uh, in, in particular, we're going to focus on the idea of not uh, being overly precise. Um, but effectively, yeah, we don't have to know um, too much data. We don't have to be super precise uh, on some things. Uh, because, well, you know, we're running a simulation of a real-world process, and the real-world process is not that accurate. You, know, you, you can calculate to the micrometer how long a particular uh, piece of wood should be, but the saw that you're cutting it with is only so accurate, so d don't be overly specific. Um, speaking of cutting wood and saws a note about logging um producing text output to a log file or a console screen is actually surprisingly expensive for a computer um so something that you could do that would eliminate some unnecessary work would actually be to well not do quite as much logging okay that does have some negative effects uh, in terms of making it a little bit harder to figure out what your program has been doing and debugging and that kind of thing um, but ultimately, time spent logging is consuming CPU cycles uh, and being overly verbose in this area uh, is taking a lot of work. Uh, in particular, one of the anti-patterns that you can uh, end up with is if you have, say, different levels of logging, so you have you know, debug logs and info logs and warnings and errors, uh, if debug logging is turned off, don't generate the logging string. <laughs> before deciding whether or not it's going to be printed to the console or written to the log file. Because generating that is not helpful if you're not going to print it. So the statement that composes the string that's going to be printed should be inside the if debug is enabled block. Otherwise, you're wasting some time. So a hybrid between do less work uh, and the next strategy we're going to talk about, be smarter, uh, is caching. Uh, and this is store the results of an expensive but side effect free operation. So whether this is an I.O., you know, you're reading in some data uh, and, uh, and you're going to use it for something, you store that uh, and you can reuse it as long as you know that it is valid. Uh, and this will save you from you know, doing that I.O. operation again, which takes time. You know, it, it slows you down. If you know that it is valid, then you know it's valid. Caching is uh, quite important uh, in certain situations. Uh, we'll, we'll see an example of that uh, in a little bit. In the words of SCAR, be prepared. Uh, if you know something that the user is going to ask for in advance, then you can have it at the ready to provide upon request. Here's an example from a project that I worked on a few years ago. Users want an Excel report of various statistics on their customs declarations. You don't have to know anything about customs declarations. You just have to know that this is a way that managers can see how much business they're doing and you know, which uh, employees are the most productive uh, and how it's all going in terms of actually executing their daily business goals. Now, Report generation can take a long time, especially if you ask for a large amount of data. You know, it is December and you want year-to-date information. Well, you know, that's 11 months and a bit. That's a lot of data. Um, so it could mean a long wait. As an alternative, you can have data that's pre-generated and stored in the database. You just update that data as necessary. So, you know, we do the month closing procedure uh, and the month is closed and you generate all the statistics for the month and then you're done. When you need it, you can just retrieve that information quickly. You don't have to calculate the summaries and the averages and any of that anymore because it's all been calculated. You can update as necessary, whether that's we are calculating a new month, so you update the year-to-date information, uh, or you have to make a correction to a previous month, then you regenerate that month's data. Either way, you've got it done. And then when the user asks for the report, you are well prepared. You have the information, it's available, you just say, yep, uh, this is what I want, and you produce it. That's very convenient, users like it a lot, it encourages them to use the Excel report. And then the strategy that I mentioned, be smarter. Uh, some of it is obvious and low-level stuff. You know, um, If you use a better algorithm, it has better uh, performance, uh, in, you know, asymptotic performance. So you know, as the number of elements in the collection gets bigger, you know, a better algorithm uh, gives you more benefit. Hopefully, you will have already thought of those kinds of things, uh, but it's still worth mentioning. 
Uh, and then there are the constant factors. Um, so in a, uh, in a previous algorithms course, you probably talked about, okay, you know, binary search is you know, log n kind of behavior, and you know, insertion sort is n squared behavior, and you would say, okay, those are the... Um, those are the asymptotic factors but there are also the constant factors uh, and these are things that don't change very much uh, and they don't change with the number of elements in the collection but they count uh, in terms of uh, how long it takes to actually use the collection accomplish your goal compiler optimizations which we will talk about in this course do improve the constant factors hopefully uh, but we also might think about some more complicated things along the lines of you know, cache, uh, so what data is in the cache, uh, and data locality, what data is located near what other data, uh, and also just density issues. How tightly can we pack our data uh, into, a, uh, into a given amount of memory? Um, sometimes, uh, thinking about being smarter, uh, what you're looking for is already found in a library. Um, you might use a more specialized library that does the tasks that you need more quickly. Um, that might not be better. Um, you might actually um, be able to write more optimal code for your specific use case yourself. If you know some specifics about the use case that you're talking about, uh, that might actually be beneficial. Uh, it's a hard decision. You will have to you know, approach it with some, with some data to uh, make a determination about, do you think it is better to uh, you know, work, on, uh, work on this using a library or to write your own implementation? Writing your own implementation sort of comes not recommended sometimes. You have to ask yourself, are we doing what we're best at? Uh, and that's, that's important. Um, then there is, well, the money approach. In the words of Scrooge McDuck, my money bin. Um, so once upon a time, and, and by this I mean like 30 years ago or more, it was okay to write code that had terrible performance on the theory that next year's CPU would actually make it run better. Um, okay, uh, spending a ton of time under these circumstances, optimizing your code to run on this year's processor was kind of a waste of time because next year's processor will be faster and, you know, like a lot faster. Uh, and so you would just be better off working on something else instead. Those days seem to be over. We're going to talk about uh, CPU hardware uh, a little later on. But CPUs are not getting very much faster these days. The changes that we see are meaningful, but they're evolutionary changes rather than revolutionary change. Uh, in the sense that you know, it's no longer, oh, you know, next year's CPU is twice as fast as last year's. You know, there's there's a lot to consider uh, in that regard, uh, and ultimately we can't just say, well, no big deal, hardware will bail us out. Sometimes the CPU is not your limiting factor, of course. Uh, your code might be I.O. bound, uh, and by I.O. bound we mean that is the slow step, it is what is limiting your uh, speed up. Uh, in which case, yeah, throwing some money at it might actually be a really good idea, because, you know, buy some SSDs it will dramatically improve the performance uh, of, of your computer. Uh, you might be swapping out to disk, uh, which is really ruining your performance. Okay, then buying some RAM might actually improve the situation a lot. Um, spending a few thousand dollars on hardware in such a scenario is probably a better investment uh, than uh, asking you know, lots of programmers to invest their time uh, into trying to make your program faster. Ultimately, um, RAM is cheap. SSDs are not that expensive. You know, programmer time is an expensive resource. Uh, and so if you can you know, make a significant gain by investing a little bit of money, you should do so. Don't, don't waste people's time. Okay, um, here's a strategy that comes up a lot. Uh, and uh, it, it echoes from a time when uh, compilers were not that smart. Um, you can ask the question of, should I just write assembly? Can I outsmart the compiler by writing assembly by hand? The answer is usually no. Never say never. Um, but the answer is usually no. Um, compilers are likely to be better at generating assembly than you are. Uh, and moreover, the specific assembly instructions that you issue aren't always exactly what the CPU is going to execute. CPUs accept commands in x86 assembly or ARM assembly or whatever it is, but they reinterpret, they do their own thing. 
they don't operate on those commands directly they take it as this is what i want but it figures out how it can best uh, give you what you asked for so with that in mind um it is important to understand what the compiler is doing and why it can't optimize certain things uh, and giving some hints to the compiler uh, so that you can help it help you uh, will turn out to be an important thing uh, but broadly speaking trying to outsmart the compiler isn't likely to work as i say broadly speaking um, it is entirely possible that you can think of a scenario where, yes, uh, it is working uh, very well to uh, optimize manually, and that might be the case. Um, I, can't, I can't rule out every scenario and you know, every, every, uh, every possible use case, uh, and sometimes the compiler does not do a good job and a sufficiently good programmer will be able to outsmart it, uh, and that's okay. I'm just saying don't count on this as a good strategy compilers do a decent job these days uh, and writing assembly is hard so let me tell you a story uh, about a different excel report uh, this was related to warehouse inventory and not specifically customs declarations but kind of similar um, and uh, some user opened a ticket uh, in which he said uh, the report appears to have been running for three hours i think it's stuck no, um, the, the user, theory being understandable and all, um, was not quite correct. The uh, report in this case uh, was not stuck. It had reached a 30-minute time limit that was set in the application server, uh, and the application server kills it when it's been running for 30 minutes. Okay, um, the goal is to prevent a runaway task from uh, taking up excessive CPU resources. All right, um... You could say to yourself, look, the first thing I want to do is uh, just disable that 30-minute limit. Not necessarily a, uh, a winning strategy. Um, you know, it, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. But how do I speed up this task to get it under the 30-minute time limit? Not knowing anything about the report, you can't really give me any suggestions. So uh, why don't I talk about some actual ideas uh, as to how the report runs, and then you can see uh, you know, what what that actually translates to uh, in terms of where our time is going. So what's going on in this report? Well, there's a step where we select the transactions, you know, the warehouse transactions for a given period from the database, okay? Um, and uh, then we have to update all of them. Uh, and when we update them, that is, we are applying the most up-to-date exchange rates uh, and also look up the article information. You know, article is whatever item it is. You know, it's carpets uh, or uh, processors uh, or pencils, whatever it is. Uh, and we update it with the latest facts, figures, exchange rates, all of those things. Um, so step one was to look at it in the profiler, uh, and the slow step was mostly database operations. According to what I found, it was retrieving exchange rates, fetching the article data, storing all the transactions, uh, and ultimately I could make adjustments based on what I learned from this. Uh, and one of the things that uh, occurred to me, of course, is that it's inefficient to ask for the exchange rate every single time. What we should do is cache that information. Uh, so when the exchange rate is um, the exchange rate is loaded for the first time, just hang on to it somewhere. Don't go fetch it again. We don't need to fetch it again. We can just use that every time we need an exchange rate. Um, exchange rates are defined um, based on the uh, day of the month, so they don't float. Uh, you know, if, if the report runs for 10 minutes, the exchange rate won't change in that 10 minutes, uh, and it, it will not present a problem if that occurs. Um, so retrieving an exchange rate 500 times gets reduced to once per currency. Same thing with an article. You know, there might be a lot of transactions that relate to moving CPUs in and out of the warehouse because, I don't know, maybe there's a real shortage of CPUs uh, and it is difficult to find them right now. Just, just saying. Couldn't possibly happen. Uh, in which case, the you know, up-to-date article information for that, again, you only need it once. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to do that uh, every single time. Uh, and moreover, if you uh, scan over all of the articles uh, and exchange rates in advance, you can request all of them in one 
um, in one database call instead of asking each database call individually because there is a small amount of overhead associated with each database call so it would be a little bit more efficient to ask for them all at once. Um, one more strategy for doing less work, uh, although this was asking the database server to do less work as opposed to the program calling it, which is instead of pulling all of the fields for the uh, object in question uh, from the database, just get the ones you actually need. Uh, and when you save the transactions, you only update the parts that change instead of update the full transaction and you know, have the uh, object relation mapping thing do all of its magic. Just skip all of that, just use update statements uh, and get it all written out directly. Ultimately, uh, when I combined these things, it brought the report time under 30 minutes uh, and this could in fact run to completion. So the customer was happy. Eventually, as more and more items move through the warehouse, the strategy kind of ran out of steam because, you know, as much as you can speed up this individual processing, uh, it doesn't solve everything and we were facing the 30 minute time limit again. The solution to that was to break report generation up into parts. So you do one part where you update all of the items and you do another part where you update the exchange rates and so on and so on. Uh, and it eventually ended up having about four parts uh, and each part starts the next one when it's finished which has a couple of benefits one each part now has its own 30 minute time limit in which to execute and number two if something goes wrong part way you can resume from whatever step was last completed so if stage three fails you don't have to start again from the beginning you can start the stage three part again so sometimes uh, sometimes splitting it up in that sense actually helps. Okay, so with the discussion of latency, uh, which which did go a little long uh, behind us for the moment, we'll also talk about uh, the idea of doing more things at a time, that is the parallelism type stuff. Uh, and in addition to speeding up an individual item, we can do things in parallel. Uh, and it is frequently easy to just throw CPU resources at a problem. Uh, we will study, of course, how to effectively throw more resources at such problems. Um, and you know, again, because CPU manufacturers uh, have difficulty making individual cores faster, but they are giving us more cores, it makes sense. It's you know, congruent with the hardware that is available. In general, parallelism improves your bandwidth, but not your latency. Um, we'll see as we get into some more of the stuff about parallelism, and you'll remember this if you've uh, worked in a concurrency course as well, that it introduces some headaches uh, and some additional overhead is necessary to keep things working as it should work. Now, different kinds of problems are amenable to different sorts of parallelization. Uh, if we have a web server, then simultaneous requests can easily be parallelized. Uh, you know, when a request comes in from one user, we can at the same time work on an independent request from a different user, uh, and that's easy to parallelize. On the other hand, linked list traversal is somewhat more complicated. Why? Well, to you know, know where the next node is, we have to look at the current node, so it makes it very hard to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to you know, take this part of the list and you take that part of the list. For this reason, uh, we often work with arrays where it's relatively easy to say, okay, I'm going to take the lower half of the array and someone will take the other half, and then we're done. Another thing that's very interesting is pipelining. Uh, and modern CPUs do this, but you can do it in your code as well. Uh, and pipelining is very much just like an assembly line. You split a task into a set of subtasks, and then you execute those subtasks in parallel. When we get into the details about hardware, we will talk about pipelining specifically. You may have also learned about pipelining uh, in, uh, again, a previous course where there was discussion of concurrency. Now, for actual parallelism and not just concurrency in your program, you need multiple instruction streams executing simultaneously. Um, to give it a, a student example for this, if you are working on two assignments concurrently, you might only be working on one of them at a time, but you started assignment one for course A, uh, and you've answered two of the questions in it, and you say, okay, I'm going to put that aside for now, and I'm going to work on assignment one for course B. 
Uh, and in that sense, you have both of them in progress at the same time. That is concurrent, but you're not working on them in parallel because you're working on only one of the two assignments at any given moment. It would presumably be very difficult for you to work on both assignments at the exact same time. Uh, when it comes to the computer, when we talk about parallelism, we mean that like, if you paused execution on the CPU, you would see that there was more than one instruction stream executing at the instant that you paused it. Uh, and we can do that, uh, we can have that by increasing the number of CPUs available, both you know in terms of multi-core processors or having uh, a motherboard that supports more than one chip on it, uh, or having a cluster of machines, uh, we get different communication costs, different latencies uh, with each of those choices, uh, and there are other kinds of hardware, you know, vector processing units, uh, or we could use GPUs, uh, for example, as a way to increase the parallelism of what we are doing. Now, you may have noticed that it is sometimes easier to do a project when it's just you as opposed to just you and a team. The uh, graphic here, I, I think, should be uh, familiar to just about anybody who's worked on a group project, uh, especially if you don't get to choose your group. Uh, and the same applies to code, right? If we are going to parallelize our code, uh, there are additional uh, problems, there's additional overhead, there's additional uh, management that is necessary. Now, there are some domains of problems that are uh, what are referred to as embarrassingly parallel, uh, and a lot of these problems don't apply to them because you don't really need a lot of coordination or communication. Uh, for such a thing, it's very easy to communicate the problem to all the processors and get the result back, and they don't need to interact uh, as workers to actually complete the task. The canonical example of this is Monte Carlo integration. Each processor computes the contribution of some subrange of the integral, uh, and basically by dividing it up, it's very easy to divide up. You say, here, this is your section, here, this is your section, uh, and then each processor can execute without uh, needing any input from any other CPU, uh, and then return the result. We'll divide the remaining things into limitations and complications. So limitations. Uh, first, a task can't get started without knowing what it is supposed to do. You know, workers need work, uh, and coordination overhead is an issue, as I said in the example of folding the um, paper airplanes. If it's going to take me a long time to hand out the paper, that's a big problem, because it significantly affects how long it's going to take to actually complete it. Similarly, if the problem lacks a succinct description, you know, it, it can be difficult to know what can be done in parallel because it will be hard to know what depends on what. We'll cover the subject of dependencies in some more detail uh, a little bit later on. Um, also, there will potentially be some recombination of results with other tasks. When we are done, uh, when workers are done with their part, we have to assemble the results. Some things are inherently sequential, uh, and inherently sequential problems are the kind where you know, step n plus 1 depends on the result from step n. So in a sequential program, it doesn't make any difference if a loop iteration depends on the result of the previous iteration, but such formulations generally prohibit parallelizing the loop because we have to do the loop sequentially, otherwise we don't get the right answer. Sometimes you can find an equivalent formulation of the loop that is parallelizable, uh, but sometimes we haven't found that yet. Uh, and broadly speaking, you could say that code contains a part that is sequential and a part that is parallelizable. That is to say that if we look at our code, there will be some segments that have to be done in a specific order, they have to be done in a sequential order. Other things could potentially be done in parallel. If the sequential part dominates, if it's the biggest part of your program, if it is the most important part of your program, if it's where all of your time is going, then executing the parallelizable part on many CPUs, even an infinite number of CPUs, isn't really going to speed things up very much. Uh, and we will ultimately be limited by how much is the sequential part. The formulation uh, that describes the rules and limits what the maximum speed up is is called Amdahl's Law, and we will talk about this soon. And as you will already know, it is difficult enough to make sure that a sequential program works correctly. 
this is a complication to be sure, uh, and making sure that a parallel program works correctly is even more difficult. And the thing that makes it more difficult to determine if your program works as it should uh, is that there's no longer a total ordering between program events. Uh, and that is you know, when you sit down and think about in what order is the program going to execute, there's no longer one fully correct answer. There are several possible answers uh, and hopefully not too many possible answers, but uh, there will be partial ordering at least. So based on your use of synchronization constructs and you know, communication in the program, you will get some guarantee that says event A is supposed to happen before event B, but other events where uh, there is no such coordination could happen in either order, XY or YX. A data race occurs when two threads or processes uh, are trying to access the same data simultaneously or concurrently, I should say. Uh, and at least one of those accesses has to be a write because reads don't interfere with one another. So at least one of the two has to be right for there to be a problem. This can lead to nonsensical intermediate states of data being visible uh, and avoiding data races requires coordination between the participants to ensure that these intermediate states don't become visible. Typically that is done using some sort of locking mechanism. Doesn't have to be the only way to do it. We'll learn about some other uh, mechanisms for this kind of coordination later uh, if, uh, if locks don't make sense for the scenario or you don't want to use them for some reason. The other thing that can occur is deadlock. Uh, and deadlock will occur when none of the threads or processes can make any progress. This is typically because there is you know, competition over some resources and we've ended up with a cycle in the resource requests. To avoid deadlock, uh, one of the things that we will uh, encourage is enforcing an ordering of the locks. Again, if you took a previous concurrency course or you've uh, gone through the uh, previous uh, catch-up material that I've mentioned, uh, it will give you some indication as to here's how a deadlock could arise and here is how uh, it can be avoided. Uh, and ultimately, one of the strategies that we're going to count on is using locks in the correct order. Uh, this enforced ordering prevents some of the problems that we could see, such as deadlock. And one thing that we're going to think about uh, towards the end of the course uh, is, well, will it scale? Performance is great, but it isn't really the only thing that's worth talking about. We also care about scalability of your program. What is the trend of performance with an increasing load? A program is frequently designed with a certain load in mind that's specified along the lines of, well, it should be able to complete X transactions per hour. A properly designed program will be able to meet this intended load. Uh, and ultimately, if the program is doing a good job, then as load increases, its performance will remain okay. If performance deteriorates rapidly with increasing load, that is to say, you know, with more work to do, its performance gets worse and worse and worse, uh, then we would describe it as being not scalable. That's a bad outcome. You don't want that. You do want your program to be able to adapt to whatever load is placed upon it. If we have good program design, not scalable behavior can be fixed. Uh, if we have bad program design, no amount of things that we learn in this course will really help. It's just, as the saying goes, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, you know, it doesn't actually address the big underlying problem, which is to say we've hit an iceberg and we are in big trouble. Even the most scalable systems have their limits, uh, and although higher uh, throughput or higher output is better, nothing is infinite. There's only so much that we can do, uh, and we can push it but we can make some serious progress if we uh, make an effort, but nothing can handle infinite load.